So, hi everyone. My name's Claire Byrne, and I'm going to talk to you today about a three-month research project I did. Um, and I did this with a cybersecurity company here in Belfast. Um, I actually wrote my master's thesis on this project because um, I was studying for my master's in cybersecurity at the time. Um, so the aim of the project was to deliver an elastic cloud deployment model for honeypot networks in order to capture more sophisticated at attack data. So basically, um, I had to find a way of creating a distributed, scalable, cloud-based honeypot network that was changeable in real time with minimal, if any, downtime. So this was really hard for three reasons. Um, so making a honeypot realistic and interesting to attackers requires a lot of research and a lot of topical knowledge, as well as an insight into the Black Hat's view of the software. Um, a scalable honeypot network is very difficult to deploy, provision, and manage. Um, this all had to be done semi-automatically and autonomously on a cloud provider. And I only had three months in which to research which honeypots I would use develop how I would provision and maintain these, build a data collection solution, um, build a deployment solution, test all of this, and write my thesis. Easy? Easy. <laughs> so before I launch into the interesting part, um, I'm just going to go over the basics very quickly for those who aren't familiar with the term honeypot. At its very base level, um, a honeypot is a system running a piece of deliberately vulnerable software, hardware, or firmware. Um, in order to lure attackers to it to study their behavior. There are several practical purposes of honeypot networks within the cybersecurity industry. So first, honeypots can distract attackers from more valuable machines on the network. Um, this can be achieved by making it seem as if they have a, an interesting or lucrative um, payload behind them. So for example, a very vulnerable database of credit card details. Um, they can provide early warning about new attacks and exploits um, and allow early defense against zero days. And they allow in-depth examination of adversaries during and after honeypot exploitation. So basically, all honeypots work on the same concept. Um, they should be left alone and should not be tampered with. Therefore, any changes to or interactions with a honeypot are unauthorized. So as I said, um, I was doing this project in the Belfast office of a cybersecurity company. They already had a foundational honeypot network set up, um, so I could extract data from this to discover the most attacked areas within an enterprise network. So after a bit of research and data transformation, um, I found that the most attacked platforms within the enterprise network were the content management systems, Joomla and WordPress. I decided to investigate a bit further, and I found that WordPress had the higher market share and user base, and that exploits were constantly being found and discovered for, them, for it every week. Joomla, on the other hand, had a lower user base, um, and at the time of this project, which was July 2016, um, the last published CVE involving Joomla was published the previous year in 2015. So because of this, and another number of factors which you can see on the screen, I choose WordPress as the focus of this project. After a lot of agonizing research, um, I finally chose the software stack that I was going to be using for the project. I'll give you a very quick overview, as it's really important in understanding the final architecture of the system. So I discovered that a honeypot version of WordPress existed already um, as an open source and very, very bare bones project on GitHub. Um, this was called WordPod, and it was a Python-based Flask app, um, which could be made to show different themes and plugins, like a real WordPress installation. Um, it also detected probes um, for plugins, themes, and other common files which are used to fingerprint a WordPress installation. Um, it uses an, a protocol called HP feeds, so honeypot feeds, um, to send this data back to a server, and that's based on based on JSON, and is a, it's a published subscribe protocol, so it's easy to use. Um, oops. <laughs> so for a server, I used Anomaly's open source um, honeypot server called the Modern Honey Network, or MHN for short. Um, using HP feeds, Data from the honeypots would be fed back to the MHN server and then collected by a Python backend, which I wrote for data analysis. Um, I would spin up the honeypots within Docker containers um, so they could be easily destroyed and replaced should anything get out of control or should the honeypots go stale. Um, all this would be deployed on top of Amazon Web Services within EC2 instances. And this was a really good idea because it provided not just reliable cloud infrastructure, but um, also a way of deploying the honeypots to different geographical regions and getting interesting data about that. 
So on this side of the screen, you can see the initial architecture that I built for deploying the WordPress honeypots. And this initial deployment here was done without using Docker. The architecture gets significantly more complex once Docker is added into the mix. Um, so for the initial deployment, I decided to deploy to five different countries to begin with. Um, these countries were these countries were Singapore, Tokyo, Sydney, Seoul, and Sao Paulo. Um, so in the end, Singapore was the most attacked honeypot, with Sao Paulo getting no attacks at all. Um, and I would use this data in the development of the next phase of the honeypots. So here um, you can see the starter page of the WordPot honeypots with no, no modifications. It looks vulnerable, but not very enticing. Um, what's to be gained from defacing this? Not much. So I decided to do some research and spice it up a bit. So basically, there are several factors, factors which could affect the attack rates of honeypots, those which I, I could control as the honeypot deployer, and those which I can't. Um, those which I can't control include the motivations of the attacker, and these seem to fall broadly into one of five categories or so. So whether there's desirable secrets, like login details or credit card details behind the first defenses of the system, um, opportunities for financial gain, and the ability of the attacker to circumvent the defenses in place. So, for example, if a site is protected by strongly secured TLS, um, hackers are less likely to attack this than a site that has no security certificates at all or any other defenses in place. Um, political factors can also be a, a big lure for attackers. Obviously, hacktivist organizations like Anonymous exist. Um, an attacker boredom can be a factor. So this is quite unpredictable. I mean, people might just want to um, test out tools they find or um, you know, test out a new piece of software they come across. So there's also a number of factors affecting the hit rate of honeypots, which I can't control. Um, or which I, sorry, can control. <laughs> so I can control the number of honeypots deployed. And this obviously is statistically significant in the hit rate. The more honeypots I deploy, the more hits I'll get probabilistically. Um, the number of regions that the honeypots were deployed in, so varying these geographical regions will obviously get me more hits. Um, the accessibility of the pots. So at present, these honeypots were not Google indexable, and obviously this is going to affect the, the type of attackers I'll get. So I won't be getting any attacks from users who only use Google Dorks or aren't using mass scanning bots to find vulnerable WordPress sites. Um, and obviously, the honeypots need to be stealthy and realistic looking. An attacker's not going to go for a, a site that's obviously a Python class gap rather than a, a WordPress installation. They're going to know that's a honeypot. So I needed to research how, how that was possible, and like within a three-month project, that was quite difficult. <laughs> um, another factor is that attacks might have been happening to the WordPot honeypots, but they weren't being logged. So um, I'd found from my research it was possible to extend the capabilities of this word pod to make it more sensitive and add triggers that would send additional information back to the server. So I did just that. I looked at the log files of the first deployment of honeypots to find out which URLs had been tried by attackers to see if there was anything I could use, which plugins they were probing for, which common files. I also searched on ExploitDB and other, other exploit sites to see if there were any p particularly popular or recent WordPress vulnerabilities. Basically, I was looking for vulnerabilities that were both new and current, so more likely to be attacked, and popular and uh, exploited like very often. So I created three fake plugins based on these criteria and one fake common file, a PHP file that supposedly allowed remote procedure calling over HTTP, um, I also investigated the WordPot code and made everything work together to increase the sensitivity of the honeypots using HP feeds, as I said. So at a very basic level, um, an attack was logged each time a new URL was tried from the base IP address of one of the pots. So I also had to create a fake theme for the WordPress honeypot to make it look more appealing and realistic. So this theme, it was deliberately amateur looking and stated that <coughs> 
stated that the site belonged to a new startup within the finance industry. So this is obviously a first iteration, but it can be improved upon. I also created a fake hidden web shell in order to try and allow fake command execution in the hopes that somebody would attempt it and we could study their code. Now obviously this one isn't very convincing, but it's just to show you the different avenues of research I went down. We didn't get any hits on this, but again, it's something to be improved upon. So by this stage, um, I've managed to get data feeding back to my Python backend, and all that was really left to do was to containerize my new, shiny, very vulnerable financial startup site. So as you may already know, Docker containers are stateless and throwaway, meaning they'll one run, pro run one process, and when that process is killed or terminated, the container will cease to exist. Um, that's exactly what I needed, and I wanted to be able to tear down and rebuild honeypots quickly and automatically, switching out my fake plugins um, within them just as required. Um, my Python backend would provide an insight into which fake plugins were most, most popular and which were actually going stale, and I could create new fake plugins on the fly quickly and easily as new exploits were posted online. So this is what the Docker file that I wrote looked like in the end, and um, it, it creates a call to an entry point script, which uh, begins the automatic deployment of honeypots in a certain region. So in the end, this is what the actual architecture of the honeypot looked like in a single region. Um, there'd be multiple wordpot instances in a single region, running inside Docker containers, hosted on ECS. Um, they'd be deployed automatically on the spin-up of a new EC2 instance, governed by task definition, um, within the EC2 containers. So all of these would be inside their own virtual private clouds, with the MHN server being on a separate virtual private cloud, for security reasons. <coughs> so right, by this stage, you probably want to see some results. Um, I left this secondary honeypot deployment for two weeks, during which I was frantically writing up my thesis. Um, and I got some very interesting results. So I deployed 30 WordPot instances to five AWS regions, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Singapore, Oregon, and Sydney. First of all, the number of probes on the honeypots increased from a total of 40 in one month with five honeypots to around 800 probes in two weeks. Um, I also noticed that there was a gradual decline in honeypot probes over time, which is really good news because that's what I expected. Um, the most common user agent of attackers um, was called ScanBot. Again, that's what I expected, um, mass scanning bots with the next most popular being curl and something called zgrab, which I wasn't familiar with. Um, the most common country for attacks to come from were the USA and China, but I should mention that obviously these countries mightn't be entirely accurate, because most people would probably be using VPNs or Tor. Um, this chart here, it mightn't be too clear, um, but it states the most commonly appended plugins to the IP addresses of the honeypots in the URL bar. So one of these is XML RPC, which is one of the fake plugins I created, um, and yeah, that, that's a good that's a good sign because it showed that I've done a good job. Um, I also conducted an experiment where I left one of the security groups of one of the honeypots completely open, um, so that traffic could come both in and out of the honeypots. So this is actually the most interesting bit. Um, this yielded some very unexpected results indeed. And I can still only really speculate as to what happened, so I need, might need your help on that. Um, I'll tell you what I saw, and maybe we can work it out. So, during the first week, the number of attacks on the Honeypot network kept rising and rising and rising. And there were odd URLs being detected by the, the Python backend. Um, what, I what I would expect to see in this URLs chart here would be the IP addresses of each Honeypot that I that I'd set up um, along, like, alongside a count of how many times those IP addresses have been probed, and perhaps with um, the IP address slash um, a plugin or a, a common file that they were probing for. I didn't get any, I, I, I started getting some weird things that weren't, weren't in that, those categories. So the URLs that I was getting were not, they didn't contain any English words. So for example, one of them was wj11.com. This was really suspicious, and at first I posed the idea that the honeypots could have been made entirely too sensitive, and this string being captured was the next URL that, it, that an attacker 
went to after going to the IP address of the Honeypot. However, the Flask application can only detect URLs in which the base address of the IP is the IP of the Honeypot in question. So unless an attacker was typing um, honeypot IP address slash wj11.com, that wasn't possible. Um, I noticed a very frequent string which appeared in the list of URLs it was a base address entitled checkproxyradar.com. So after some very quick and very careful research, um, I found out that this was a site that actually sold proxy sites so that a user's IP address could be hidden. So basically, I think the weird URLs I was getting was a result of my honeypots being compromised. Um, they fell from my experiment. <laughs> um, they took the IP address of the site, of the honeypot sites, and sold them on this proxy site. I think that's why I was getting all these strange URLs. This would kind of make sense, um, as the Flask app would be logging the URLs that were being navigated to whilst going through the honeypot site as a proxy, assuming it had been bought by someone on proxy, proxyradar.com. So, oh, oops. <laughs> so this was, this was a really positive result. Um, so it shows that the honeypot sites were successful and that they looked realistic enough to mimic legitimate and really, really vulnerable WordPress sites. It also allowed some insight into the websites that attackers would frequent in order to hide their activities and proved that it was, in, that it was possible to track activity of a user while they're using a proxy, provided that proxy is a honeypot. Um, so this was quite the breakthrough. Um, so it could theoretically be used to create a proxy honeypot to track illicit, illicit activity and discover new sites hosting illegal or malicious content so that these can be either reported to the authorities or bragged about online, depending on your morals. <laughs> oh, I keep doing that, sorry. So yeah, that's the best explanation that I could come up with for what happened. But if anyone has any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to come up to me at the end. Um, <clears throat> so in conclusion, this was an extremely short three-month project for my thesis at Queen's. Um, I really, really want to extend and continue it. I just haven't had time at the minute. Um, I started my first real job the month after I handed this in. And I'm now changing jobs again to go to Rapid7 next Thursday. But once I'm settled there, I'm definitely going to continue this in my spare time. So if anyone wants to help or contribute, I'd definitely be up for that. So thank you for listening. And remember, um, if you go in search of honey, you must be prepared to be stung by bees. <laughs> <laughs>